On Tech News Today, Toyota's spending a billion dollars on a Silicon Valley artificial intelligence lab. Plus, Lytro is working on a killer 360-degree virtual reality camera. And a new crowdsource app works like Google Waze, but for drones. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, November 6th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the online marketplace for buying and selling used gadgets. Shop from a variety of certified pre-owned electronics or trade one in for cash. Give a new life to a used device. Visit gazelle.com today. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash TNT to apply for a loan now. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news of the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Our co-anchor today is Mashable Senior Tech Correspondent, Christina Warren. How are you doing, Christina? I'm great. I'm great. I mean... You have bright red headphones. I do have bright red headphones because it, it we're, it's almost... it's. I, I've, it's Halloween was last you can. week, so now it's Christmas season. Yeah, I think because I can. I'm not ready for Christmas season. I'm not I'm even not ready either. for Thanksgiving season. I'm not even sure I'm ready for for thank, for Halloween, but uh, I guess but that, that ship has week, sailed. Yeah, so I know. That, that has sailed. That I has know. sailed. Well, speaking of things that are weird uh, on timing, <laughs> I heard that the BlackBerry Priv was supposed to ship today on the 6th, but then it was delayed till the 9th on Monday. And now I'm hearing that it's today is available uh, on AT&T. AT &T. Uh, what do you make of this? Is this uh, good information? I mean, this comes from Ryan Whitwam, yeah. who posted about it on Android Police. And I sent him an email about it saying, what? And he said, oh, yeah. All the, he said, all the AT&T stores around me show it as in stock and ready for pickup. So unless AT&T is confused, which yeah. he points out would not be without precedent, it is, no, it's out today. Would yeah, no, it should be out today. Uh, it's interesting because it's already it's, it was available, I think, today or maybe even yesterday in uh, in, in Canada, right? So it's already available in Canada. Um, I thought that, yeah, I thought it would have been delayed until Monday from AT and T, but I mean, they might as well if they've got them in stock and they've got them in the stores. It's not unprecedented for phones that are not the iPhone for carriers to just go ahead and sell them, regardless of whatever date even the carriers or uh, you know the phone company have put on there. You know, if they've got them in stock, a lot of times you can get them early regardless. So, uh, I mean, hey, cool. Um, we, uh, I, I've had a chance to play around with one a little bit. It's uh, not, I mean, it's a decent phone. Yeah, and how do you like the physical keyboard? I mean, I, I don't need a physical keyboard anymore. I used to live and die by one. I, yeah. I loved my BlackBerry. I was like attached to it. Uh, but honestly, at this point, I feel like I'm slower on yeah. it, to be totally honest. Yep. Uh, but I mean, there are still some people who who stand by it, you know, the Kim Kardashians of the world. Something tells me <laughs> Kim Kardashian will still be using her Bolt 9900 and will not be using this thing because it's like, she's going to have her iPhone. She's not going to deal with Android. And she's going to have like the old thing that she knows and like knows how to use. Like, so, I, and I wonder how many keyboard diehards are kind of in that same position if they're going to be like well if i've got to have this new thing i don't know if i want maybe this implementation i don't know um i, I think it's a solid device it's actually really attractive it feels good in the hand it's really thin uh the keyboard seems to work really well it's capacitive like the um blackberry uh what is it the passport yeah. is which is kind of cool um, and, uh, I mean, I think they made a really nice device. I, I think the pricing is completely bogus. The, yeah. the non-contract pricing is way too high. Um, even in, in the, the BlackBerry fans are going to be like, oh, if you look at the specs of other phones, they're, they're good too. No, uh, the, the difference is that those are from other companies and even those companies have a hard time selling that. I mean, you're going up against the Nexus 6P and, 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 and the, the six, uh, the five X and, and some, um, other phones. And, uh, I feel like. Uh, the price is too high, but it looks like a good phone. Are we going to see a backlash against the giant phone movement? For example, uh, I'd love to see BlackBerry come back with BlackBerry Pearl. That was a really tiny phone, but I've also heard rumors that, that so Apple could ship a four-inch iPhone. Do you think that's credible? Yeah, I mean, I think it's credible-ish, right? Like, if they have a bunch of these four-inch screens and it's actually at this point cheaper for them to somehow use some of the guts of, of another device to uh, to, to sell and, and get rid of, like, that, that allotment of screens, I mean, I think that could work, for, especially for some markets. But I feel like 
part of the reason the iPhone has been so successful and part of the reason we had this huge rise in Android stuff is because of the big phones. Like I think there might be a backlash to like the super gigantic ginormous phones, which is obviously why for the the Nexus 6 um, uh, P, you know, they went smaller because the last one was too freaking big. But um, I think that uh, as much as I personally like smaller phones, I don't know if I'd give up a smaller phone. Uh, I, if I'd give up what I have now at Screen Real Estate for um, something that, that is even more compact as much as I love little tiny phones at this point, like I almost wonder if, you know, we were, we rely on our phones too much. And frankly, we need battery more than we ever have before, which is usually helps when you have more surface area. Yeah. I, I want a bigger phone that is mostly battery. I want a bigger battery, two day battery on, with an iPhone or something like that would be great. All right. Well, let's jump yeah. into the regular news. Toyota this week announced a massive $1 billion investment in a Silicon Valley based research organization tasked with developing next-generation artificial intelligence and robots. Evan Ackerman wrote about it for IEEE Spectrum and joins us now. Hey, Evan, how are you doing today? Hey, Mike, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Why does the world's largest car maker want AI and robots? Well, it's all about robotic cars, right, at least in the short term. Um, Toyota is maybe a little bit behind relative to some other companies as far as getting those autonomous cars on the streets, so it needs to do this major push to catch up a little bit and... Toyota is also hoping that it can leverage uh, the same kind of technology that's in autonomous cars to help bring robots into the home as well. So you wrote, uh, didn't you write a piece last uh, month basically saying that Toyota was investing $50 million in similar R&D? So is, is, is this, I guess, just kind of part of the trend, like you were saying, that maybe they haven't been as up to date as some of the other manufacturers, so like it's more important for them to, to be investing in this stuff? What, what's different about this investment versus the one they made last month? Yeah, so last month's investment was uh, Toyota giving $50 million to artificial intelligence labs at Stanford University and at MIT okay. directly. And this is just like they have a billion dollars. They're going to be buying buildings. They're going to be hiring a couple hundred people over the next five years. And it's it's really their push to, to take technology that's developed in labs and help it make that transition out of labs into like cars and robots that we can actually buy. Um, Evan, I, for one, would, uh, so obviously they're working on artificial intelligence for self-driving cars or more automated cars. They're also working on home robots, mostly to take care of the elderly, but also do things around the house. And of course, this is a Japanese company, so that robot will be a person, it'll be like the Asimo or something like that, it'll be like a person. I, for one, would like to see that be one product. I'd like to see them come out with a humanoid robot that does things around the house and then gets in the driver's seat and drives the car, sort of like that uh, Motobot that Yamaha announced last week, which is basically a robot that drives a motorcycle, but for cars. That's what I would love to see, but they don't listen to me. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, a designer of really nice cars whose name, name is Ken Okuyama, who said last week that he fears that Apple and Google could take over the car industry in the future and that the likes of Toyota would just end up being suppliers for these, uh, for these Silicon Valley uh, technology and car makers. Is this Toyota's concern as well? Is that where they're jumping into, in, into this kind of technology to compete with Apple and Google and for that matter, Tesla? Um, Toyota is taking a little bit of a different approach. Um, most other car companies that are working on this autonomous technology are very focused on like actual self-driving cars. And at least for the short term, Toyota's concern is, is more about safety. So they want to have cars that can drive themselves if you want them to. But kind of as a step to that, they want cars that will be able to deal with any kind of accident situation. And they actually said a couple times in their press conferences that their goal is to develop a car that cannot crash by 2020 or even 2019. And that's a pretty strong statement from any company. But Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Yeah. I could crash it. <laughs> it may not let you. It may take over. You may not have a choice. You'll just have to sit there and not be crashed. So, uh, how many people do you think Toyota is going to try to hire uh, from from Silicon Valley to kind of you know work on a lot of this stuff? But, but what do you think that's going to happen? Or well, they've said two hundred engineers over the next um, five years, which is, I mean, if you space it out, it's about one person a week. Um, but they're going to have a lot of trouble doing this. Um, the the jobs market for People who know how to do robotics and artificial intelligence is just crazy right now. There's right. all kinds of companies in Silicon Valley who they're, they're just throwing money at people and they just can't hire anybody because there isn't anybody out there. And companies like um, Uber recently 
uh, they got a lot of bad press and a lot of kind of bad rep in the academic community by just cleaning out, uh, it was Carnegie Mellon's autonomous driving center, I think. They just kind of bulk hired everybody. And um, Toyota is aware of this problem and they're going to have to walk a very fine line, not just kind of stealing everyone from the academic community that they can to try and get them to come work for Toyota. But they're aware of it. It's, it's going to be difficult for them and they're going to have to throw a lot of money at it. And honestly, I, I don't know how quickly they're going to be able to ramp this up. Is Toyota going to be able to retain their lead? I mean, for example, whenever there's a certain tectonic shift in any industry, the the old players tend to go away and new new startups uh, take over. For example, when uh, Hollywood moved from silent pictures to talkies, the, the silent picture uh, companies just got swept away because they just didn't get it. And these new startups took over, and those are the movies, uh, the movie companies that we know and love and or hate today. Uh, is this going to happen to Toyota? Are they going to be just sort of swept aside? What's your gut feeling on this? I don't think so. I think this, this approach is right for them because um, – they have a lot of resources. As a Japanese company, they're not as nimble as American companies in general and especially smaller American companies. But by taking this approach, they can kind of slowly integrate um, existing technology and existing research kind of into this pipeline that they're trying to develop to turn it into production. And so they've got money to invest in startups. Um, and they're open to taking, you know, not just developing their own technology, but also embracing like fundamental research from universities and startups and kind of just helping that turn into a product that they can then use. So that should give them a chance to catch up versus companies that are trying to just do everything internally. Well, I do love my Prius. The only flaw that the Prius has is that it makes me do all the driving. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to have a self-driving Prius. Evan Ackerman is at spectrum.ieee.org. And on Twitter at Bot Junkie. <laughs> Evan, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Bye bye. We got some more news coming right up, but first I want to talk about the high price of iPhones. I want to talk about Gazelle, which is a place where you can get a lower cost iPhone than you can get elsewhere. And of course, Apple has a really interesting strategy in selling phones. Unlike most phone makers, they don't have a super high-end phone and a super low-end phone and a bunch of phones in between. They always come out with a super high-end phone, but then they sell you a lower-cost phone, which is basically the previous model or maybe the model before that, depending on what market you're in. So Apple does sell. Uh, right now, they have the iPhone 6S line. They also continue to sell the iPhone 6 line, and in some markets, they sell uh, previous phones to that. Uh, and uh, they offer a price for that. In in every case, uh, Gazelle is going to beat that price. If you want to buy a phone, everybody talks about the high price of iPhones. Now you can do something about it. And just go to gazelle.com and buy your iPhone there, uh, and you'll get a much better price. And for that matter, you're an iPad. You can buy an iPad on Gazelle for $199. This is a very expensive tablet if you buy it brand new. Uh, you can buy a used one on Gazelle for $199, $250 or something, depending on what uh, which which iPad it is. It's a great place to buy an iPad, especially if you're uh, shopping for the holidays or buying something for yourself. You want to get an iPad, but you don't want to spend a fortune. This is the place to do it. It's just a great price, and uh, they're going to give you a really, really fair price, which you can't say always for if you buy it on Craigslist or something like that. You don't know what you're getting. And uh, it also has to be said that Gazelle will guarantee these devices. They inspect them fully, and then they let you return them within 30 days. And uh, they don't care why uh, you want to return it. If you want to return it, they'll give you all your money back. It's uh, zero risk on your part. An entire month with this device, uh, and then you can send it back if you want to. But you probably won't. They are really, really good at making sure that these devices work flawlessly. Give new life to use electronics. Trade in for cash or buy certified pre-owned. Visit Gazelle today, and we thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Today. Facebook yesterday announced the launch of two new ways for marketers to do their marketing. One enables businesses to automatically insert local information into ads based on the user's locations. And the second offering is a new data tab for businesses. Kathleen Tchaikowski writes about social media for Forbes and joins us to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Kathleen. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. So glad you're here. Now, how does this location-specific advertising work exactly? So these new tools apply to businesses using locations for pages on Facebook, and they need to have at least five different storefronts um, and pages for each of those, each of those storefronts. Um, and what the new ad creation tool allows these businesses to do is pull information like ad copy, links, 
call to action buttons, um, for example, a prompt to call the, the business or to find that business on a map, um, and really quickly and easily insert that information into unique ads that will show up for users who are nearby each of those specific locations so that users get kind of a specialized localized ad experience. Um, and the second tool that Facebook announced is an expansion of the data that it's giving businesses um, based on um, which users see these ads. Um, so there's now a new tab within the page insights tab that businesses can access. And for the first time, Facebook is telling businesses what percentage of users nearby their location saw that ad. Um, and Facebook is also telling businesses in aggregate, not by absolute numbers, um, the gender, age of these users that are seeing the ads um, and foot traffic around the businesses at different times of day to help inform businesses um, as to you know what time users are going to be likely to, to be coming to uh, their company. So is this stuff, is this location specific stuff, is this just on mobile um, or is this working on the desktop too? Um, my understanding is that this applies specifically to mobile. Um, users will only be factored into the data that Facebook is gathering if they have location services enabled. Um, so as a user, you could choose to ex exclude yourself from um, being included in this data. But my understanding is it's, it's mobile specific. Okay, tell us about this page insights tab. Sure, so this is basically um, a data tab that um, gives information to businesses about how their ad campaigns are running on Facebook. And with this announcement, Facebook is expanding the information that businesses have access to within this tab. Um, and you know, for Facebook, this is an important initiative. Facebook is trying to continually boost its share of global mobile ad revenue. Um, in 2014, Facebook represented about 18% of global mobile ad revenue, and that compares to about 38% um, uh, from Google, according to eMarketer. And uh, for Facebook's overall business, mobile represents mobile advertising represents now in its most recent third quarter 78% of total revenue. So it's a really important driver for Facebook, and it, this initiative helps you know push that percentage even higher. All right. Well, um, this is uh, this is, sounds great. If you're into Facebook marketing and advertising, when does all this roll out, Kathleen? So the new ad creation tools um, have rolled out globally um, starting yesterday, and the Page Insights new data tab that is. Um, kind of available on a limited access currently in the U.S. And Facebook said it, it plans to expand access to that data tab over the coming weeks. All right. Good to know. Kathleen Chaikowski is at Forbes.com and on Twitter at KChaikowski. Kathleen, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. Bye-bye. A new mobile app is being called A Ways for Drone Pilots. It's called Hive Mapper, And among other things, it helps you avoid crashing your drone into buildings. Laura Kolodny is a reporter for Dow Jones, and she also writes, her stuff shows up on the Wall Street Journal website as well. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So glad you're here. Now, what is this Hive Mapper business, and how does it work? So it's, it's crowdsourced, and that's the comparison to Waze. Basically, um, you have all these drone pilots flying around, and they can the, that community can contribute to this massive map of the Earth. The app itself uh, can be used in flight or to plan a flight, um, and it, it sort of it shows you these three D photography, uh, you know, aerial images that uh, include alerts when you're approaching some obstruction. It could be a power line, a building, some natural structure, um, and basically just keeps you from crashing your new toy. Uh, it could be used in a professional or hobbyist setting, but uh, it was interesting. The founder mentioned to me that there are a lot of other map approaches, but none of them have uh, kind of used this leverage, the sort of natural community zeitgeist around drones to um, to improve their data in this way. And he has a background in uh, sort of freelance crowdsource application. He, he ran a company called Gigwalk before, so you can see the expertise porting over um, into this into this space. Um, but I mean, it's uh, it's still about 20% proprietary. So they do part of the data gathering through computer visioning and, you know, acquiring 
uh, data from satellites or other sources that they are going to work into it just to verify all the community information. And I think that's where it's garnering all the comparisons to Waze and, and things like OpenStreetMap. So um, is, there a social, is there a social component to this too? Like can, can pilots, uh, you know, chat with one another? Can they, can they maybe, uh, you know, discuss, okay, hey, this would be a cool place to go or, or I'm going to be in this area at this time or, or anything like that? You know, to be honest, I don't fly drones. I'm not a drone operator yet. And um, it would be useful for the media work. But uh, <laughs> so I haven't used this and I don't know. Um, it, it's community editable. Um, but I don't think it's used like a chat app in that way. Can you talk about the company a little bit? I mean, this is a, a brand new startup. They're pretty small and they just raised some funds. What is the current status of this company? Uh, they're, they're here in the Bay Area, Burlingame. Um, they have landed, you know, actually the round closed in May. Um, it was a 2.9 million seed round, which is really meaningful at the seed stage. Um, I think that's an indication of the confidence that these investors have in a, a serial entrepreneur here and um, his experience in crowdsourcing concepts as well. Uh, you know, drone investing is really, it's just hot right now. Uh, drone related technologies are drawing more investments in, in the U.S. than they have in in. Uh, past years and quarters, and we see different firms like Sequoia getting involved. Um, you know, Dow Jones, uh, which owns this uh, incredible fact-checked, you know, deep deep data source called Venture Source. Um, that the Q1 through Q3 alone, there's been about um, 42 deals in the U.S. in drone-related technologies with. Uh, $139.5 million going to drone deals in Q3 alone. Um, so we're seeing, you know, a lot of uptick in, in uh, venture capital interest in the space. Um, I feel like China was ahead of us. It used to be about investing in the sensors, the components, the hardware, and now it's really about the intelligence here. Um, there are a handful of other startups they're going to compete against. But as I mentioned, their sort of like crowdsourced, community edited approach to the cartography is really different. Others have been more... Um, focused on amassing the regulatory data. So to keep drones away from places where they're not wanted um, or where it's a safety concern, you know, and actually where they can't legally go, um, like AirMap, that's sort of a digital sky atlas that's really focused on real-time data about the regulation is very fragmented in the U.S., which could be challenging for pilots. Um, and uh, GOVS in, in Europe, which, you know, it's, it's more of this heavy-duty 3D cartography for drone navigation, but they also do that for other industries like naval and, and industrial businesses that, um, that need that. And anyway, it's, uh, it's really heating up, um, but this is definitely a meaningful seed deal from a, a founder who has a great track record. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that story, Laura. Laura Kolodny is at WSJ.com. That's where you can read her stuff. And you can find her on Twitter at Laura Kolodny. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us today. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. And in news you can lose, Lytro is getting into the 360-degree camera business. Their product is called Emerge, and it uses Lytro's famous light field technology, which they believe will make their 360-degree videos computationally perfect. A price hasn't been set, but if you have to ask, you probably can't afford it. It should cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Here comes the video. We're trying to replicate reality here. There's so many things that the current technology does not do. You know, there's a shift in culture where I think the idea of immersion um, has gained more traction. There's still a lot of limitations. What we ultimately want Are we is reading his mind? CG his lips content are okay. mixed with <laughs> captured content in a convincing real way that doesn't cost you $5 million. Creatively, we're going through Here the exercise of making a lot of VR, both with video and CG, and we're finding all the pain points. Camera systems is a pain point. Post-production is a pain point. Distribution and playback is a pain point. You need the ability to move around in the it world. really is. You need the ability to interact in the world. Six degrees of freedom in a live action environment that felt photorealistic would be the next step. Presence is definitely one of the key points of VR as a medium. If you can move in the space, you know, the limit is the stars. With Lytra Emerge, we took the approach of going back to first principles and thinking about what do immersive storytellers want in terms of an, an I don't an think they're going to show us the camera to here. Be able to no. Create it's a bunch of guys content. talking. For direct, oh, it is. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Data that we're able to recreate a model of the scene that's being. Now there's a canoe. 
and that recreation is not just what color are things in different directions. I have the feeling that the file size on this are be is each thing along. Oh yeah, but I mean the target on this is as is users serious, move in the six degree freedom creators, experience. It's not, you know, then we redo that computation at a kind of theoretical. I hope they sell that canoe too. That looks cool. And that's how that we deliver cool. an experience that's truly immersive. Lightro merge consists. Huh. Of a radical new camera design. So, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting pivot. Here we go. There's the camera. The full light field volume. And Even the tripod looks expensive. Six degree of freedom experience. It's like the size of a beach ball, apparently. Yeah. It's the Lytro Merge server, which gives you all the storage oh, and all the processing that you need in order to capture and manage Wow, all yeah, see, data. I mean... We've you know something has big if it comes if it comes, comes with a server closet you know that the file size is going to be exactly. pretty large oh no i mean it, i mean the, this is this is clearly being created for uh for people who are trying to create the next kind of evolution of vr and and virtual you know content and that sort of thing and and hey doing an all in one system that costs under a million dollars that's actually not a bad a uh, business for them to pivot into. Um, and they certainly have some of the expertise there. I think the big question is whether or not they can, um, you know, kind of have this all-in-one solution that doesn't cost $5 million, but just costs, you know, like $200,000. Um, that, uh, I mean, I think their goal, I'm guessing, uh, they haven't explicitly said this, but I'm thinking they're trying to be like the red of, of like, you know, what, what red did for kind of 4K yeah. and like high definition stuff. They're trying to do that, but for VR. I'm really surprised, generally speaking, by the range of prices and options for VR and mixed reality. It, uh, you, know, uh, you know, five years ago, I would have guessed that it would have been all, way, all of the options, both for the, the, the goggles, the games, the cameras, all of it would have been super high-end. Uh, but it's great to see this spectrum where you have, on the goggle side, you have everything from cardboard all the way up to you can pay as much as you want. And for the cameras, you have like very low-cost solutions all the way up to this thing. Yep. I'm sure that somebody else will come out with very high-end stuff for Hollywood as well. Uh, and it's great to see. I, I want Hollywood to be experimenting with this, and I would like to be able to do it myself. So I think that, you know, th this, is a, this is a great uh, world we're entering into because you have the whole spectrum. If, you, if, if, it, if there's like this digital divide about who can get in and make content in 360, then that's going to be a problem for the content. So, yeah. Uh, but, but we do need a high-end, so we thank uh, them for that. And like I said, I think these file sizes are going to be enormous because this is uh, this is obviously some computationally oh, yeah, no. intense. This uh, is so computationally stuff. intense. I mean, the fact that, they, like you said, they're providing their own server setup and 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 their own kind of you know all in one system. I mean, and it's got a lot of it. I'm sure is proprietary too. This is going to be insane. But I mean, it, it's going to be good. I think like. Um, I think that having these types of, of solutions, even the fact that companies are even thinking about them is really impressive because even if you can't afford the $200,000 or whatever it's going to cost, the idea that maybe, you know, you could rent something would, would be really, I think, instructive for people who are trying to kind of create really high level VR content um, because it's not, I mean, that that's how, that's how this thing, it does eventually become available to everyone is we start kind of at this, this midpoint um, to go back to kind of the red example, you know, that's sort of like it, it can be kind of an entryway where you're thinking, okay, you know what, this isn't completely out of the realm of possibility if I'm a high-end content producer, and uh, that's uh, that's cool. And of course, as consumers, we want high-end content to view, even if we have an inexpensive device, uh, it should be uh, even better. Well, we got some more stuff for you coming right up. First, let's talk about Prosper, the Silicon Valley way to borrow money. Prosper is a great way to get a debt consolidation loan. You got a bunch of debt, the, the interest rates are too high, you can get a low interest rate loan with Prosper, pay off all that high interest debt, and it's like free money. You can get a home improvement loan. You can get a personal loan for business use. You can get a car loan. You can get a boat loan. You can get a uh, short-term or bridge loan. You can get a green loan. There are all kinds of different types of loans, but you don't go to a bank and sort of ask permission to borrow money from them and then be uh, victimized by their various fees and nickel and diming. No, you, it's the Silicon Valley way. You go to a website and you put your project on the website, just how much you'd like to borrow, what the purpose of the loan is, and you can just right there on the home page select your credit quality and they'll give you your interest rate just instantly click on the green button and there's your there's your interest rate that you're going to pay and that's that's it that's the interest rate if if that's your actual credit score and then uh the payment comes right out of your account there's no additional weird fees that you didn't expect it's all just very straightforward it's a fantastic way uh to borrow money it's like the uber or airbnb for borrowing money it's a better way to do it it's the silicon valley way to do it and, of course, the interest rate is uh, very, very low. For up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days, go to prosper.com slash TNT. That's prosper.com slash TNT. 
We got some email from a TNT fan named Matt Coddington who said, Hi, Mike and team. Love the show. Regarding your comment about Google Cardboard on Thursday's show, you complained about the fact that you have to hold cardboard to your face, but at least one manufacturer offers a strap that snaps onto the cardboard to hold it to your face. It's not the most elegant solution, but it does allow for you to experience cardboard without holding onto it for an extended period of time. And uh, I want to say thanks to you, Matt. I didn't know about this. The company Matt is referring to is called Unofficial Cardboard. And the product is a 1995 headset called Unofficial Cardboard 2.0 Plus. The strap is optional and costs about five bucks. And you can buy both the cardboard unit and the strap at unofficialcardboard.com. And Christina Warren, I'm surprised more cardboard makers don't have a strap option because, of course, yeah. you know, who wants to do this for like three hours? No, you don't. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, because that is one of the big struggles. It's like, if I could hold this thing up to my face, you know, um, I, I would like to think uh, that more people would do it because it wouldn't even be that much of a, of, a, of, a, of an ad, you know, to just have even something to go over your, I mean, I guess you really couldn't go over your ears. You wouldn't need it to go around your head. But yeah, I mean, I think that it's great to be able to have a, the hands-on option, but like add a strap. It's not that big of a deal. More people should do it. Do you know, does the, does the one that Mattel makes that actually is really cute, the one that looks like the, the um, old... If you master, does that have um, a, a headband thing on it, or is that just holding up to your face too? Yeah, no, that's just like the old Viewmaster. You got to hold it. So yeah, it's <sighs> just it's strange. And and you know what's weird is that you know cardboard is light. It actually has right. an advantage over the heavier, more uh, fully featured VR goggles because you don't have this. The problem with if you've ever used VR goggles, the problem is that it pulls your face forward because it's it weight in the front and not balanced in the back. So. Companies keep innovating on how they can balance it, how they can make the strap more comfortable and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, cardboard is almost weightless. And so a simple strap could make it great to put on your face, although it's not that comfortable because it's just like this rough cardboard. Still, uh, a little innovation in that space is sorely needed, I think. So. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, hopefully we'll see that. I mean, because there's, there's certainly plenty of opportunity for that, right? Or you can just duct tape it or super glue it to your face. This is another option. Our TNT mm -hmm. fan of the day is Steve Hearn in London, who watches Tech News Today in his home studio. And he is a caricature artist. And there's his studio. Very, very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Christina Warren, what are you up to these days? And what uh, can we fans of Christina Warren expect out of your uh, keyboard uh, in the week ahead. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm finishing up. I'm putting the finishing touches on a uh, Apple TV um, app guide, and uh, so that should be out um, hopefully today, and that'll be really exciting. Yeah, I told you. I told you in, uh, on Twitter that uh, my son was on his way to the Apple Store for some entirely different reason. <laughs> Listening to the show last week, and by the time he got to the Apple Store, he was ready to buy an Apple TV and yes. did so, and he loves I'm glad. it. It's really it's fantastic. so good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, other than the text entry, which is. Not, but but the voice entry, everything about it, it's so good. Yeah, we visited him last weekend. He was showing off and showing us all these different features. It's really cool. Very, very well done. All right, Christina. Well, thank you so much for co-anchoring, and we'll see you next week. See you next week, Mike. Bye-bye. Right, Let us know what's on your mind. Send email to twit.tv. I'm sorry, that's TNT at twit.tv, or call 260-TNT-SHOW. That phone number is 260-868-7469. You can subscribe to Tech News Today at twit.tv slash TNT. And you can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv slash live. Follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Follow me on Twitter at Mike Elgin. And don't miss our other new show, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific, every single weeknight. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Clanthus and edited by Kevin King, I think. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Monday.